terrorism is a scourge which has affected many countries. It has claimed the lives of many innocent people, and it goes against fundamental democratic values and human rights, starting with the right to life, which all states bound by the Convention have a duty to protect. Governments, police, secret police, and the courts have been at the forefront of fighting terrorism. But how can they do this and make sure that they respect their own human rights obligations? Would it be right to torture suspects in order to obtain information? What about surveillance of telephone calls and emails? Should the government be able to cancel elections, close down newspapers, or hold trials in secret? These are the kinds of questions the European Court of Human Rights has had to answer in its work of upholding the European Convention on Human Rights in the signatory countries. Indeed, the Court's very first judgment in 1960 concerned a man who had been detained under special anti-terrorism powers in Ireland. As you will see, the Court's judgments demonstrate that states have to reconcile their actions in fighting terrorism with their obligation to respect human rights. Let me point that the Convention does give states some leeway to deal with what is regarded as emergency situations. This is to be found in Article 15, which allows states to derogate from certain obligations. This can be done in time of war or as a public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Any measures can only be to the extent strictly required by the situation and have to be consistent with the state's other obligations under international law. However, and to answer one of the questions raised earlier, there are certain rights which cannot be overridden, including the right not to be subjected to torture or other forms of ill-treatment as guaranteed by Article 3. This is one of the rights considered as absolute by the Convention, and no derogation is possible under any circumstances. Even before invoking Article 15, states can restrict most Convention rights, those which are not regarded as absolute, on certain grounds. This includes emergency situations, such as, for instance, a threat of an imminent terrorist attack, but is not limited to such situations. States enjoy what the court has called a wide margin of appreciation, in other words, wide discretion to balance the rights of individuals against the interests of national security. As will be shown in this presentation, the fight against terrorism does not give states carte blanche to interfere with the rights of those within their jurisdiction. Governments will always need to demonstrate that the measures they have taken to combat terrorism were justified on one or more of the grounds set out in the Convention text or is interpreted by the Court in its judgments. Let's now have a look at some key cases involving issues related to terrorism. To prevent terrorism, states may take measures that, for instance, interfere with the right to respect for private life, freedom of expression or association, or the right to free elections. Article 8 of the Convention says everyone has the right to respect for his or her private life. However, the fight against terrorism permits the use of special surveillance methods in order to collect information which might help prevent terrorist acts or aid in the arrest and prosecution of suspected terrorists. As early as the 1970s, the court accepted that legislation granting powers of secret surveillance over post, mail, and telecommunications was, in exceptional circumstances, necessary in a democratic society in the interests of national security and or for the prevention of disorder or crime. More recently, the court found that the surveillance of suspected terrorists using a global positioning system did not violate their right to privacy as guaranteed by Article 8. In that case, the court was satisfied that adequate safeguards were in place to prevent the arbitrary use of such methods. On the other hand, 
powers granted to the police under special anti-terrorism legislation to stop and search people without any reasonable ground to suspect them of an offense was found to have breached the applicant's right to respect for their private life. In that case, the discretion conferred to the police was too broad and was not accompanied by adequate legal safeguards against abuse. Let's now look at freedom of expression, which is protected by Article 10 in the context of the prevention of terrorism. The court found that the conviction of journalists for publishing statements made by suspected members of an armed terrorist group, which was seen as an incitement to violence, did not violate the journalist's rights under that provision. Likewise, a moderate fine for complicity in condoning terrorism, which had been imposed on an author of a provocative caption and caricature about the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001, was not found to have breached the author's Article 10 rights. In that case, the court accepted that given the timing of the publication, just two days after the attack, the author must have been aware of the impact it was likely to have. In another case, suspending the publication of newspapers under special anti-terrorism legislation, even for a relatively short period of time, was found to breach Article 10. By employing forms of censorship, the domestic courts had, in the court's view, imposed unjustified limitations on the crucial watchdog role of the press. No violation of Article 10 was found in a case which had been brought by a majority shareholder or a weekly newspaper who had been convicted of disseminating separatist propaganda. The weekly he owned had published strongly worded readers' letters accusing the authorities of brutal acts of suppression in southeast Turkey. Given the overall context of terrorism in which the text had been published and the fact that they were capable of stirring up violence and hatred, the court accepted that the domestic authorities had given sufficient and relevant reasons for interfering with the applicant's freedom of expression. So what about the prevention of terrorism and freedom of association, which is protected by Article 11 and which includes the rights of political parties and other organizations? Well, one government was found to not have violated that provision when it dissolved political parties whose direct political aims were contrary to the democratic principles of that country's constitution. In that case, the domestic courts had already found that the political parties in question had been instrumental to a terrorist organization and that the acts and speeches of their members had not ruled out the use of force in order to achieve their aims. In another case, the court found no violation of the right to free elections where electoral groups who had pursued illegal party activities and who had been dissolved because of a link with a terrorist organization had been excluded from a taking part in an election. The dissolution of the groups had been proportionate to the aim of the protection of democracy. And given a lack of any arbitrariness on the part of the authorities, had not infringed the free expression of the opinion of the public. To stop terror attacks, states may be required to use lethal force. However, as mentioned earlier, they are under an obligation to protect everyone's right to life as guaranteed by Article 2, and this includes the lives of those suspected of terrorism. The use of lethal force in self-defense must be absolutely necessary if it is to be justified under that provision. For example, the 1988 killing by British military servicemen of three members of the Irish Republican Army suspected of preparing a bomb attack was found to violate Article 2, since the operation could have been carried out without recourse to lethal force. On the other hand, the death of hostages in a Moscow theater due to a gas which had been used to neutralize the hostage takers was not found to violate Article 2. 
Although the gas was dangerous and potentially lethal, it had not been intended to kill. The gas had produced the desired effect on the terrorists, rendering most of them unconscious, it had helped in the liberation of the rest of the hostages, and had reduced the likelihood of an explosion. However, in that case, the court found separately that Russia had failed to comply with their positive obligations under Article 2, as the operation to rescue some 900 hostages had been insufficiently prepared. The arrest or pretrial detention of suspected terrorists must be in conformity with their right to liberty and security as guaranteed by Article 5. In the first place, there must be reasonable grounds to suspect someone of terrorism if his or her arrest is to be justified under that provision. Though the police may frequently need to arrest a suspected terrorist on the basis of information which is reliable, but which cannot, without putting the source of the information in jeopardy, be revealed to the suspect or produced in court. The court has therefore held that Article 5, Paragraph 1 of the Convention should not be construed so as to put disproportionate burden on the authorities when taking effective measures to counter terrorism in order to discharge their obligation under the Convention to protect life. However, in a case against the United Kingdom, the court ruled that the indefinite detention on national security grounds of foreign nationals suspected of terrorism, when those people could not be deported as they risked ill treatment in the receiving country, was contrary to Article 5. To allow that type of detention, Britain had claimed a derogation under Article 15, which we looked at earlier but the measure was found to have unjustifiably discriminated between British and foreign nationals. In general, the length of detention of suspected terrorists should not exceed a reasonable time. Accordingly, the pretrial detention of detainees accused of belonging to a Basque terrorist organization for between four and a half and almost six years was found to be contrary to Article 5, Paragraph 3. Article 5, Paragraph 4 guarantees the right of those suspected of terrorism to have the lawfulness of their detention reviewed speedily. The absence of such a review led to the finding of a violation of that provision in the case of Iraqi national suspected of having links with Al-Qaeda who had been detained in a closed transit center pending deportation from Belgium. States must also respect procedural guarantees of review. No violation of Article 5, Paragraph 4 was found in the case concerning the withholding on national security grounds of material related to the lawfulness of the detention of foreign nationals suspected of terrorism. In that case, the procedural requirement of review was satisfied as the non-secret material against five of the applicants had been sufficiently detailed to enable an effective challenge of the lawfulness of the applicant's detention. Just like anyone else facing criminal charges, suspected terrorists have the right to a fair trial is guaranteed by Article 6. In the first place, security or public order concerns cannot justify a violation of the right of the accused to remain silent and to not incriminate himself or herself. The court found that a statement which the police had obtained from a minor who had been arrested on suspicion of aiding and abetting a terrorist organization and who had been denied access to a lawyer during police custody could not be used as evidence against him. In another case, prohibiting a detainee's access to a lawyer for almost seven days, limiting the number and duration of their meetings, and preventing them to take place in private was also found to violate Article 6, Paragraph 3C of the Convention. 
Moreover, the use in criminal proceedings of statements which were obtained through torture or any other form of ill-treatment renders the, the proceedings as a whole automatically unfair. That is contrary to Article 6. This applies not only where the victim of the treatment contrary to Article 3 is the actual defendant, but also where third parties are concerned. For instance, the court ruled that the expulsion of an applicant from the United Kingdom to Jordan, where he had been convicted in his absence of various terrorist offenses, would violate his right to a fair trial. This was because there was a real risk that evidence obtained through the torture of other persons would be admitted against him in a retrial in Jordan. Another example is the case of a Moroccan national arrested and prosecuted in Belgium for taking part in terrorist activities. The court found that this, the incriminating statements which had been obtained from a witness in a third country should not have been admitted into evidence by the Belgian courts without first ascertaining that the witness in question had not been subjected to treatment contrary to Article 3, as it had been claimed by the applicant in that case. Suspected terrorists in pretrial detention also have to be treated in a way which is not contrary to Article 3, and as mentioned earlier, it's absolute ban on torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. The use of certain interrogation techniques, such as hooding, the deprivation of sleep, food and water, or the subjection to noise, has been found to be incompatible with Article 3 in view of the intense physical and mental suffering they cause to the victims. Convicted terrorists, enjoy the same protection against treatment contrary to Article 3 while in prison. For example, full-body searches, including the most intimate part of the person to which a convicted terrorist had been subjected after each prison visit for over two years, were considered to constitute degrading treatment. However, no violation of Article 3 was found in the case of a dangerous international terrorist who had been sentenced to life imprisonment and who had been kept in solitary confinement for eight years. In that case, the court decided that his overall conditions of detention had not been severe enough to amount to inhuman or degrading treatment as it took into account the physical conditions of the applicant's detention, the fact that he had not been in complete isolation, and also his character and the danger he posed. In the case of another detained terrorist, the court held that a lack of communication facilities, coupled with major difficulties on access to the prison for his visitors, amounted to inhuman treatment. However, in increasing activities with other detainees and in the frequency of family visits, was found to have made his subsequent detention compatible with Article 3. Where there is a real risk of a suspected or convicted terrorist being subjected to ill treatment in another state, the prohibition on a return to that country is absolute, regardless of his or her past offenses or conduct. For example, the court ruled that enforcing a decision to deport a terrorist to Tunisia, where he had been convicted in his absence, would violate his Article 3 rights, since the Italian government had not been provided with sufficient diplomatic assurances that the applicant would not risk treatment prohibited by the Convention. The court has also been faced with cases where respondent states extradited or deported suspected terrorists despite the court's indication to the government's concern under Rule 39 of the Rules of Court to refrain from doing so until it has 
had an opportunity to examine the merits of the applicant's complaints. For example, the court found a violation of Article 3 and Article 34, where an applicant, a Tunisian national, had been extradited despite a ruling under Rule 39 by this court from Belgium to the United States, where he faced life imprisonment for terrorist offenses, which could not be regarded as reducible under the Convention. In recent years, certain states have been involved in what is called as extraordinary rendition of suspected terrorists, also known as extrajudicial transfer it is a measure implying a transfer of a person from one jurisdiction or state to another for the purposes of detention and interrogation outside the ordinary legal system. It is absolutely incompatible with the rule of law and the values protected by the Convention because of its deliberate disregard of the guarantees of due process. For instance, the court found a violation of Article 5 in the case of the unlawful detention of a German national of Lebanese origin who had been suspected of having links with terrorists and who had been the subject of an extraordinary rendition. In particular, he had been handed over to agents of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, CIA, who had been operating at the time in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. In that case, the court also found a violation of Article 3 on account of the torture and inhuman and degrading treatment to which that applicant had been subjected while in detention. Breaches of four articles of the Convention, Article 2, 3, 5, and 6, were found in the case of a suspected terrorist who had been handed over to CIA agents operating in Poland and who had been detained at the United States Naval Base in Guantanamo Bay in Cuba following an extraordinary rendition. In its judgment, the court also required Poland to seek assurances from the United States authorities that the applicant would not be sentenced to death following his extraordinary rendition. Past and recent history demonstrates that states face serious challenges from terrorism and the violence it spawns, and that they are frequently required to take exceptionally stringent measures in response. As the court stated in one of its judgments, a state cannot be required to wait for disaster to strike before taking measures to deal with it. As has been shown in this presentation, in their fight against terrorism, States are required to strike a balance between their duty to protect national security and the lives of those within their jurisdiction and their obligation to respect other rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Convention. When examining whether anti-terrorism measures comply or violate the Convention, the Court looks carefully at all the circumstances of the case. This kind of scrutiny at the European level is to help to make sure that the fight against terrorism and the protection of human rights can coexist. All the cases referred to in this presentation can be found in the HUDOC database. Further information is available in the court's website and in relevant training material of HELP, the Council of Europe, program on human rights education for legal professionals.